Hello, I'm Dr. Vicki Smita. And I'm Dr. Eric Mazur. Today we're going to discuss the future of healthcare, a small topic, with Dr. John Murphy. He's President and Chief Executive Officer of the Western Connecticut Health Network, of which Doral Hospital is a new partner, and Chairman of the Board, Irv Shames. Welcome to Health Talk, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank Welcome. You. And something Thank tells you. me we'll be having a very interesting show today, <laughs> just from what we've said so far. So healthcare is changing. I think that's no big secret anymore. And uh, I think there's a, it's fair to say there's a lot of fear and uncertainty on the part of just about everyone about what these changes are going to bring uh, for our future. So maybe we can start a little bit by, uh, by talking about what some of these changes might be that are, that are coming our way. I think any, anyone who's read the newspaper or watched the news lately, it's hard not to hear something about health care with the Affordable Care Act and, and the whole changing paradigm of access to health care <coughs> uh, in this country. And I think to a certain extent, to a large extent, that was driven by the unaffordability of health care uh, for not only the government who pays most of the bill for health care, but also for businesses as well as individuals and families. We simply have been producing health care that I think is of uh, average quality if, if you compare us to other countries around the world, but we spend a frightful sum of money in getting that health care. And I think ultimately, you know, we have to confront those realities, and I think that is behind some of the turbulence in, in terms of asking the question, how do we design a different system, one that produces high-quality care but does so in a more cost-efficient manner? And you're, you're a businessman, and I know that it's not just the government that's paying for this, but this has had a real impact on American business as well. This has been one of the major cost increases for American business over time, and really uh, weighs not only on the individual corporation, but on our competitiveness as a nation, because our costs have escalated more than other places. And I was reading a Time Magazine article, uh, I think about a year ago, that said we spend more per capita of twice as much per capita than any other industrialized country in, in the world, which is really extraordinary with, with average outcomes at best. Why, why is that? What makes us so different? Then Why are we just figuring it out now or trying to figure it out now when other countries seem to have already figured out? Well, I think to a certain extent, you know, we've always prided ourselves on having the best model and we're capitalists at heart. Right. And I think that... Um, Ultimately, it did become, as Irv said, unaffordable. We spend 18% of all of our economic output is devoted to health care, and no one else pays anywhere near that. It, the second highest uh, expensed country, I think, is Germany, and they're about 10%. Japan is probably 7%. China spends 5% of its GDP on health care. So if we are going to be economically competitive, we've got to address this reality because what's happening now is it's beginning to force out other priorities. And if you look at the infrastructure of, of the nation, if you look at uh, defense spending, if you look at an energy policy, if you look at educational priorities, you can't spend 20% of every dollar on health care at the expense of those other priorities. Right. If other countries can do it, we have to figure out how did they do it. But to answer your question more directly, Vicki, I think one of the issues is that we have paid fee for service. It's the, the financial incentives that are at the heart of the system, right. which essentially pay for doing things as opposed to fee for outcomes, fee for satisfaction, fee for value. This is right. just fee for service. And I think fundamentally that has to be reexamined and is being reexamined right. so that we essentially get more for our money. So quality, bringing up the quality, because as you said earlier, the quality is not necessarily any better than any of those other countries we, we've think, mentioned. That's right, and I think the other thing that we need to remember is that we do as a nation like choice. We like to let people choose what they want to do. Right. And so that does create additional costs in the system. And a dimension of that is the fact that almost 80% of the payments in the system are not by individuals. They're either covered by government or they're covered by corporations. Mm -hmm. That's right. And so one of the things that is also going to change as we move forward is that individuals are going to assume more responsibility for their own medical care and medical expenses. And that's part of this whole thing about insurance right now is how are you going to choose what copay do you want? How are you going to choose what deductibles you have and whatever? is that assumption of greater participation in these choices on the part of the individual. I think one of the exciting things about that, which really is one of the drivers, is that 
the tools for patients to assess quality are beginning to be developed. The data are beginning to be out there. I mean, John, you could say a few words about that, but yeah. I think 20 years ago, patients, you could tell a good doctor, you couldn't really tell a good doctor, you'd go to your neighbor and say, did you like the doctor down right. the street? And they'd say yes or no. But today, we, we're really developing measures of quality. That's right, and I, I think it is about time that the, the industry, if you will, is held accountable not only for the outcomes that it produces, but ultimately for the costs that are associated with those outcomes. But there has to be a standardized way of measuring the outcomes, and I think it is very important that we post those in a transparent fashion so that people can make informed decisions. As Irv says, they're, they're interested in choice, but I think we owe them the opportunity to publicly post, here's where we are on a, a variety of measures. I think the federal government, again, because it pays most of the bill for health care through the government websites, Medicare websites, for instance, have begun to post publicly available information about a, a whole host of outcomes. And that is ultimately going to influence how much we get paid, is how good are you actually, and how satisfied are patients with the care that they receive. Another okay. component of all this would be prevention, right? That's something that we need to focus more upon as a, as a community, as a nation, not so much treating a disease process or fixing a, a broken bone necessarily, but how do you prevent that process from happening in the first place and having better uh, population health, et cetera. Do you want to say something about that? Or well, I think that basically the prevention is, uh, I think, a combination of knowledge mm -hmm. and also some type of follow-up help because we can arm people with knowledge, particularly take disease like diabetes, right. on, on what are the symptoms, what are the causes. But we also then have to have some method of making sure that they follow the regimens because we do know that if we could prevent problems, first of all, ever getting diabetes, but then if you get it, maintaining your regimen is far more efficient than if you then get into crisis and we have to treat it in the emergency room of a hospital. So I think that knowledge, help, follow-up care, all of that is going to be important. And I think it's going to happen both before the care is given and then after the care is given because the other part is helping people know how to respond after they have been ill. Sure. Of course, up until recently, and I think even still with the system that we're in, uh, one gets a hospital, a doctor gets paid a lot more for the diabetic amputation uh, than they do for the hours of counseling that it may take to have a patient manage their diabetes carefully or stop smoking or lose weight. Uh, the payment system really has to change in order to support this new model, doesn't it? Absolutely, because uh, as you say, the, the payments really are structured around the end game. W what happens when a complication arises? Right. There is little, if any, incentive in place now to prevent those complications or to prevent diabetes to the extent that you can. And I think if we're ultimately going to be held accountable for the health of a population, which is where I think this is ultimately going to go, there is, there is a finite sum of money available for us as a nation to, to do that. So I think that the dollars then have to move towards prevention to promote wellness as opposed to simply treat sickness. And I think if there is a greater deal of attention paid to health promotion and illness prevention and that the dollars flow to allow the providers who are interested in doing that the opportunity to pay to do it and pay their staffs to do it, right. then ultimately we'll move upstream more towards disease prevention. And that's really what's been holding us back, and one of the things that has been holding us back, because as a physician, and John, you'll attest to this, I'm sure, you see a patient in the office and you want to, you know, you have 15 minutes with that patient. How much preventative counseling can you do in that 15 minutes when you also have to address their medication changes and whatever else they may be there for? And, uh, and that time, the additional time you may take is not compensated time. You don't get paid for that time. So that's really where that shift, I agree with you, has to take place in order for us to get to the next, the next okay. level. Many of you will know better than I, but I, I also sense that this payment system has worked against the primary care oh, absolutely. delivery. That you know, it, uh, the system has in fact been biased towards uh, procedures, specialties, and against diagnosis and, and, and early on care. And so, as a result of that, we've got a shrinking base of primary care physicians at a, at a time when, in fact, that's going to become more and more important in terms of managing the whole healthcare system. So one of the things that 
we as a nation, we as a system have to address is how we're going to make primary care affordable and accessible. You know, I think that there's such a disparity of income levels that specialists can achieve between primary care and a procedurally oriented specialty that so many of our medical students have chosen the latter uh, to pay their large uh, loans when they get out of school because the lifestyle may be easier, because the pressures may be lower, but we really need a whole different model of care. Because we, we all, when there are three of us here are doctors, we really went into medicine to have that relationship with our patients, to, to see them care for themselves. John, I know you practiced medicine for many, many years. Right. Still see patients a day and month and enjoy it immensely. But the model does have to change because if we are going to get this right, and we have to, I think, refocus on the importance of primary care, and that has to be recognized as the anchor of, of the way we practice medicine. We have to transform the practice of medicine. But beyond that, I think there has to be a recognition that teams of individuals practice or deliver better care than solo practitioners. At least that's our belief, and I suspect you would both believe that. Absolutely. And that each provider ought to be able to practice to the, the fullest extent that their license allows them to. And that I think we have to allocate resources according to the risk that the patient has. In other words, some patients who have multiple illnesses and are quite sick, I think deserve more attention and more resources, including resources that aren't just available in the office, but we need to provide seamless care across the continuum, and that is at home or to the extent that they're an extended care facility. We, we need to provide teams of care across the entire continuum. But we can't leave it there. To the extent that people are healthy and want to remain healthy, as Irv said, I think what we want to do is we want to engage patients and members of the community and their families as partners in their care. So education is very important because we want to keep the healthy well. And those who have a single illness, whether it's hypertension or diabetes or a tobacco uh, issue, we, we want to try to manage them effectively so that they don't begin to accumulate illnesses because ultimately, if you look at the stratification of illnesses and the costs associated, 5% of the population is responsible for about half of all health care costs. So we need to manage those patients fairly intensively and, again, not focus simply on we only care about you when you're in the emergency department or in the ICU or at home. We want to manage the entire continuum. And, of course, the reimbursement system, at least right now, pays us to care for the patients in the emergency room or for their acute illness, but that very intense management that really is necessary over the continuum, there's nobody out there who is paying for it except in certain models of care. So I it is a big it, cultural shift for us. Yeah, I think one of the things that. that we touched on earlier, which is <clears throat> the advances in information technology and information sharing, mm -hmm. because to do some of what we are talking about here requires seamless availability of information on a patient across all of the providers of that care and all the sites that are providing Absolutely. it. Absolutely. You know, that from an efficiency point of view as well as an effectiveness point of view, we've got to get rid of multiple you know, MRIs, multiple x-rays, <clears throat> just because you went to see a different physician in a different office. And, and I think that, you're really getting at the point of how we can ultimately take better care of our patients for right. less money, which I want to continue to talk about, as well as specifically right. what hospitals, doctors, and providers are beginning to do to get ready for this. Believe it or not, that's the end of the first segment. We'll be back after the short break to continue our discussion. Vicki and I are back with our guests, uh, Dr. John Murphy and Irv Shames, talking about the very important uh, changes in healthcare that we're all experiencing. So we talked a little bit at the end of the first segment, Irv, you touched on information sharing and, uh, and not replicating um, procedures and imaging studies and things like that. We probably could achieve a significant cost savings just from that alone, I would imagine. I see patients fairly frequently in my practice where they've had a CAT scan at one institution, but they might have had two other CAT scans that same year. 
now whether they were necessary or not, you know, I don't want to sit here and judge, but you know, generally a 15-year-old patient doesn't need three CAT scans in the course of a year, and I would imagine it would be the same for most uh, patients in the general population. So we want to limit redundancies like that. How, how do we achieve that? Well, I think that, <clears throat> again, it's information sharing. When, when you walk into a patient, to a doctor's office, a bigger patient, we have the technology for them to know everything that's happened to you mm -hmm. within you know, your lifetime, really, but certainly within the last couple of years. And so they would know whether you've had an MRI. They, would, they could would access be. that. I mean, I understand the Freedom of Information Act. We have to respect that. Mm -hmm. But within providers, the ability to make that information available so that we don't have these artificial walls right. between physicians and hospitals, between one physician's office and another physician's office, I mean, those we may we can knock down those walls. And but John, the, the, yeah. to do that, I, I think people would be horrified at the state of information technology within medicine, although it's rapidly improving. But the costs of doing that are prohibitive. I shouldn't say prohibitive, but daunting is a better there, word. There are substantial costs because if we're going to share information as we must, it has to be digital. You, right. you can't access a paper chart after 5 p.m. if the doctor's office is closed and the patient is in the emergency department. So you have to begin with the assumption, the expense, and the commitment to go on to an electronic platform, which means that physicians in their offices have to make the significant financial commitment as well as all the workflow changes and the aggravation of moving from something that they grew up with, which is a paper chart to a, a digital environment which involves a keyboard or dictations and screens, and, and that is a challenge, and it is a disruptor, particularly for physicians who've been in practice a number of years. On the hospital side, the enormous IT investments, we've spent, for instance, a, at our institution, uh, well over $65 million over the past several years just on trying to create the digital environment that would allow us to share information. And it has to be secure, it has to be timely. You want to have access to the information you want wherever you are, whenever you need it. And in addition to providing a repository of all of the clinical bits of information that a physician may need for a patient, we also have to be mindful of what we as healthcare providers should be able to provide in terms of knowledge to individuals who want to remain well, who just want to know how do I maintain my health. We would like to be, and we think that healthcare institutions ought to be, a resource for patients. We freely and openly share knowledge with our patients. We don't sequester it, we don't covet it. We say, if you want to stay well, we're the trusted partner that will allow you to have access to the information you need so that you may never need us. And so that's this is a new role for healthcare institutions, really as, as educators and partners in wellness with our patients, with our population, not even patients, with our partners. That's, that's right. And we, we are anchored in and by our communities. We're committed to serving them. And ultimately, the, the mission is to keep them well. And, and that's what we think we have to do in order to keep them well is to create knowledge and freely share it. One of the concepts that also is percolating below this conversation, if you will, is this notion that hospitals, we traditionally think of hospitals as a building with walls. You know, we go there, we park there, we go in and we get right. what we need. The future, hospitals don't have walls. They are basically going to be seamlessly integrated across the spectrum of healthcare in their communities. So from the ability to monitor and provide information to a patient in their home, to urgent care centers, to physicians, to hospitals, to aftercare, the seamlessness of that care, of that information, is basically what is the hospital of the future. And this yeah. is really driving mm -hmm. some of the things that we're beginning to see in the healthcare market. Right. We, we alluded at the beginning of the show this new partnership among New Milford, Danbury, and Norwalk Hospital, really to be part of a single network or a single affiliated group. John, what, what, how does this begin to take us in the right direction uh, for responding to these healthcare changes? Well, we, we do think there is value as you tackle these enormous challenges of increasing the quality of the care that we provide, being willing to be accountable for the outcomes, for the health of the population, as well as for the cost of that population, 
or the cost of the care uh, to manage that population's health. In order to do that effectively, you need a certain critical mass. There are certain economies of scale that you have to achieve to be able to do that well. Not only the financial capital, but the intellectual capital you need to do that properly and thoughtfully. So this, this network affiliation, I think, represents a, a very well thought out approach to how to get that done. So we become a regional system, the region's premier patient-centered system of care, where we coordinate and integrate that care so it isn't necessarily about a standalone capability, but it's more about a regional commitment to keeping our communities well. And the hospitals really, as you said, don't stand alone within that network, but you begin to build all those elements uh, within that integrated system to care for patients when they are uh, well but outside the hospital or with multiple chronic diseases. From an economics point of view, it requires scale to produce the kind of economics that are required to face the future of healthcare. You've got to have the capital access and the low cost of capital before, because we are going to be providing more and more technology. You've got to have the ability to attract and retain very bright, talented people who understand the information technology, who have the capability to deliver. And that, again, requires resources. You've got to have the scale to be efficient. So the need to find that scale through smart affiliations is what it's about. I mean, nobody starts off to affiliate for the sake of affiliating. You go there because the overall quest is to provide efficient, high-quality health care to the members of our community now and in the future. And to do that, these are the kinds of moves we have to make. We talked, John, about primary care being very important in this new um, health care atmosphere where, and, and we know for a fact that primary care physicians are <coughs> diminishing in numbers, certainly they have over the past couple of decades and they continue to do so. So I think medical education is something we need to talk about. How do we educate uh, new medical students, bring in new physicians into uh, the communities that would be interested in primary care? How do we do that as, as a system? How do we do that uh, on a national scale? And I don't know what the answer is, but I'm, I'm sure it's deeply in, 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 engraved in, uh, in medical education and, and making commitments in that area as well. Do you want to talk a little bit about sure, that? Sure. I, I do think in addition to strengthening our clinical programs by virtue of coming together and recognizing that we have the ability and the responsibility to care for a much larger population. By doing that, you can attract certain types of very talented physicians who are willing to locate here and stay busy, professionally busy, to be satisfied with a larger population. But in addition, I do think, Vicki, we need to think about training tomorrow's workforce. And medical education is, I think, terribly important and often uh, thought of uh, on the periphery as something we'll, we'll get around to or right. we'll do it if we have the money to do it because it is a, a financial commitment to do that. But I think it's very important. And if we are going to shape the health of this community, we have to do it, I think, fundamentally by saying, well, who's going to care for them? Right. And there's no question that primary care providers are few in number and ultimately, particularly as access to health care, through some of the recent federal changes, are going to Im improve and increase the number of people who can now access the system, we will need more primary care physicians. I think the best way to get them, in addition to providing an attractive environment, is to train them, to grow your own, essentially. And that begins, I think, even at the undergraduate level, either through uh, affiliations or outreach to undergraduate college students, get them interested in the health professions, be it nursing uh, or uh, medicine or some of the, the PAs, APRNs, paraprofessionals, to create that pipeline and then have tight relationships, effective relationships with medical uh, schools mm -hmm. whose medical students can then have an exposure to what I think is a very forward-thinking healthcare system. And then beyond med school, I think you do need the residencies and they have to be more primary care residencies or even preventative care right. residencies where we tie together the, the sorts of care we say we're going to be providing with the workforce commitments to actually train those providers. So when you can marry those two, I think you do secure a bright future for the community, and, and that's really what we're trying to do. Yeah, and I think that's that's very well put. I think, you know, again, shifting the sexiness away from the procedures and really putting it back toward the primary care world is going to be key in, in, in achieving the goals that we want to achieve. Right. I, 
you just one other dimension I'd like to make sure we get a chance to talk about is we have less than a minute left okay. so. we are community not-for-profit hospitals we are committed to the health of our communities and I think as we go forward our ability to work with those communities to strengthen them and to understand their health needs is very much a part of our obligation and our commitment which uh, is what we're part of our mission and what we're here for and uh, I, I think also this is our chance as a society to get it right. right. When I look at the values embedded, and we've got less than 20 seconds left, the values embedded in this new health care system, if we get it right, we really can take excellent care of patients for less money. That's right. And take care of everyone in the community, be they rich or poor. That's right. And what a great thing to be able to do. And that's a wonderful note to end on. Uh, and I really do believe it. I know that you believe it as passionately as we do. So that's all we have time for today. As a reminder, we welcome topic suggestions for Health Talk. Please email Vicki and me at healthtalk at norwalkhealth.org. We would like to thank our guests today, Dr. John Murphy and Irv Shame. See you next week on Health Talk. Bye-bye.